Well, thank you for joining us. This is our third class in Creation Science Evangelism 201. If you have any questions, just raise your hand or say, stop me in the middle of class. Hey, I don't understand that. Let's talk about it. We'll talk about it. There are three laws of thermodynamics, okay? Very few people have ever heard of the third one. I don't remember it. It doesn't matter. It's one of those minor things. It's not a big deal. But the first law tells us matter cannot, that would be matter slash and or energy, cannot be created or destroyed by any known means. How can you create matter from nothing or create energy from nothing? So far, no one has discovered any possible way to do that, which brings up the obvious question, well, then how did the universe get here? It had to have a beginning. It, we know that matter is not eternal. It can't last forever. It's always breaking down. We'll get into that in a minute. But this first law of thermodynamics is really powerful proof against the evolution theory. Matter cannot be created or destroyed, which leaves us two logical choices. Somebody made this world, and that somebody would have to be outside of time, space, matter. Now, unrelated to them, unconnected to them, uninfluenced by them, outside of time, space, matter, or the world made itself. The only other possible choice is what some of the idiots will say, well, we're not really here at all. We just think we're here, okay? I <laughs> say so you can forget about that choice. We're here, all right? So somebody made the world or the world made itself. Now, the Bible very clearly says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It gives no explanation for where God came from. I get asked the question all the time in debates. I'll say, well, they'll say, where did God come from? I say, well, your question assumes that he had to come from somewhere. Doesn't it? What if he has just always been? But even the word always, you can't really use that in describing God because that implies time. You know, any words that imply time would be improper when you apply them to God. You know, where does God live? Well, just the where word apply, implies that he has to have a particular location. He's stuck in space. Time, space, matter are three things that we are stuck in. But if God is limited by time, space, matter, or anything else, he's not God. Whatever you're thinking of, it's not God you're thinking of. You're thinking of something else, okay? So the Bible simply says, in the beginning God did it. It does not tell us where God came from. It does not tell us how he did it. Just, he just did it. Created the heaven and the earth. If you can get past that verse, the rest of it's easy. The whole rest of the book is easy. All 33,000, 31,700 some verses, whatever there are, <laughs> the rest is easy, okay? That's interesting. And that, I, I, I have no problem accepting that. But I do understand how some people do. Because in their little brain, they've limited everything to what, if I can understand it, you know, then it's true. Well, there's a lot of things you can't understand that we accept as true, okay? Humanists, according to the Humanist Manifesto number one, now there are actually two Humanist Manifestos, one written 1930 and one written 1973. And I believe there's now a third one. Is there, Jonathan, do you know about a third Humanist Manifesto? I think there was. The Humanists got together and said, we need to tell what, what do we believe? The Humanist Manifesto one says, humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Actually, if you look at the actual manifesto up in the upper right corner, they have the uh, different planks of the Humanist Manifesto. It says, first, religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. They admit, and have always admitted, as far as I know, that humanism is a religion. See, atheism is a religion. You would have to believe there is no God. <laughs> There's no way you could know something like that. How could you possibly know there's no God? That's something you believe. You take that on faith. So Humanist Manifesto uh, says, humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Now, oftentimes in textbooks, they will have the word universe capitalized. Why, why do you capitalize a word? If it's the beginning of a sentence, if it's a proper name, or if it's deity. They deify the universe. It's just self-existing. Well, if the universe is just self-existing, how did it get here? Well, they've thought about this for a long time. And finally, the devil years ago came up with an idea called the Big Bang Theory. How many have ever heard of the Big Bang Theory before? I was on an airplane years ago, and I tell the story in my seminar part one about how I was sat next to a professor from Berkeley University. We're flying out to San Francisco, the land of the fruits and the flakes. And I'm sitting next to this professor from Berkeley, UCAL Berkeley, the most hostile audience on planet Earth. Berkeley is a very interesting place for numerous reasons, okay? This university turns out more liberals and humanists, than, it's incredible, than any other university I'm aware of. But 
They, Berkeley teaches there are no rules. There simply are no rules. So one guy came to class every single day for eight months straight, stark naked. They couldn't tell him it's wrong, because, you know, no such thing is wrong. <laughs> Nobody wanted to sit in the chair after he left, but I mean, just, <laughs> it's just, what a, what a place. I mean, if you've ever, never been to Berkeley, it's quite the, quite, the, quite the place. I've been there a couple of times. I spoke with her once for 10 hours, uh, and boy, did we have Q&A time was incredibly lively. One uh, Chinese kid who had uh, uh, come to when I spoke up in University of Guelph in Canada and really got upset with me because he believes in evolution. I, when I was speaking at Berkeley, he's now, I guess, a, I don't know, a student there, a teacher there or something. But here I am talking away about lies in the textbooks, and all of a sudden I see another video projector start, start shooting pictures on top of my picture, you know, trying to block out what, I, what I'm showing. It's this Chinese guy in the back row brought his own video projector and laptop, and he's going to shoot, you know. I said, uh, sir, if you want to speak, get your own crowd, get your own room, have them invite you to come speak, or go rent your own hall, and go speak to whoever wants to come. But they invited me, now shut that thing off, you know, and he did. <laughs> but um, Berkeley's a strange place. I, I could go there every day. I love that type of environment. I don't know what it is about me, so, but I really I thrive on that, because I know... I've got the truth. I know I'm right. It's really fun. It was scary at first, but it's fun now. But I spoke at uh, Berkeley uh, twice, uh, last two years ago, for two and a half hours. It's debate number, which debate number is that, Jonathan, uh, 19 or 20? 18. 18. 18. Berkeley finally hears the truth. We videotaped it out there. Boy, that was, they were upset. Some of those guys were so upset. Uh, poor Skip Evans, you know, works for the National Center for Science Education, all four of them, you know. Uh, <laughs> he, he was really upset with me. But uh, I'm going to win them to the Lord. I, I really don't hold animosity toward these atheists, you know. They're just simply blinded. You don't, you don't get mad at a blind person because they can't see, you know. They're, just, they're blinded. They really are willingly ignorant. And so it's something that I, as a Christian, have to say, okay, how can I help these people see the, see the light, you know, get them to see the light. But I'm sitting next to, the, next to this Berkeley professor from, uh, on the airplane. And we started talking about creation and evolution. By the way, you'll find talking about creation and evolution is easy to get a conversation started. Uh, and I do this several times, several times a week on airplanes as I'm always flying somewhere. Tomorrow morning I fly to Pennsylvania. And last week was in uh, Ontario, Canada. And the next week, I don't know, somewhere else. But uh, it's very easy to get a conversation started on creation or evolution. And that right away leads straight into the gospel. Because if there's a creator, well then... He's the boss, okay? You find out what he says and you do it. It's real simple. But this professor started talking. And, uh, I asked him what he did. He said, a professor at Berkeley. I said, oh, I, I, uh, I taught science 15 years. Uh, we got into the subject of the Big Bang, okay? And I, I said, how did the universe get here? He said, well, it came from the Big Bang. I said, well, man, I'd like to hear about this. And he was shocked. He said, you're a science teacher? You've never heard of the Big Bang? I said, oh, yes, I man, I've heard a lot about the Big Bang. And I believe in the Big Bang, you know, but my Big Bang is quite a bit different than yours. I said, you tell me about your Big Bang, and then I'll tell you about my Big Bang. So he said, well, I believe about 18 or 20 billion years ago. You know, they always start off, you know, looking off into space, you know. Oh, billions of years ago, kind of lost in space, look on their face, you know. And that's what the textbook says, like this guy here in Prentice Hall General Science. 18 to 20 billion years ago, that's a long time, all the matter in the universe, that's a lot of stuff. And the word universe comes from two Latin words, uni, which means single, <clears throat> and verse is a spoken sentence. In English, we have verse and prose. Verse is a spoken sentence, and prose is, you know, poetry that rhymes. So, universe is a single spoken sentence. That's interesting. God said, let there be light. There has been interesting research done in the last 50 years on exactly what is light, exactly what is matter. You know, what is, what is the material world? I don't think anybody knows for sure yet. We can say, well, it's made up of atoms. Okay, I understand. Okay, and then the atoms are made up of electrons, neutrons, and protons, and maybe some other stuff in there. Okay, I understand. What are they made up of? Could it be that the whole thing is actually uh, light energy or sound energy? Uh, they've done studies where they take high-energy high sound and hit a glass of water, and it lights up. 
So God simply spoke the universe into existence. That's a powerful thought. Several times in Genesis 1 it says, and God said, let there be, let there be, let there be. So the word universe means a spoken sentence, and we actually live in a spoken sentence. This is it. You're living in the middle of it. Just a spoken sentence. How many saw the movie The Matrix, you know? Where the whole thing is nothing but, you know, imagination and dots, O's and ones, you know? It's an imaginary world. It doesn't exist. I like the one where the little kid is, you know, he's looking at the spoon and it's bending back and forth, and the other guy comes in, he tries to bend the spoon back and forth, and the little kid says, Oh, that's not the exciting thing. Wait till you realize there is no spoon. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all imagination. What if everything here is a manifestation of the voice of God? God said, let there be. You know, when he speaks, the universe is created. When he speaks, the dead come to life. When he speaks, the wind, lays, the wind quits blowing, the waves lay down. I mean, everything obeys the voice of God. Except us. He's having a little trouble out of us right now, but he's going to fix that here one of these days. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, coming soon to a city near you. Uh, but all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. All the matter in the universe, think about it. You couldn't even squeeze a Volkswagen into a dot smaller than a period on a page. It's been estimated that if you took a, tr a freight train that is a mile long, a one mile long freight train, if you could compact it into solid matter and then take that solid matter and remove all the space between the neutrons, protons, and electrons. See, the atoms are mostly space. If you could really get solid matter, it's estimated a freight train a mile long would fit in a thimble. but it would weigh as much as the freight train. Now, of course, that's physically impossible to do such a thing, but you, you can't squeeze a Volkswagen into a dot smaller than a period page. And here they are teaching the kids the whole entire universe. I mean, do you realize how big this Earth is? And it's tiny compared to some of the other planets. Do you realize the sun and how many other stars there are? The last estimate by the Hubble telescope in 2003 said, we estimate there are 70 sextillion stars. Well, if you want to learn a little math here, you got million, and then billion, and then trillion, quadrillion, quad meaning four, quintillion, sextillion, septillion, octillion, novillion, decillion, who cares? 70 sextillion stars is the estimate. Most of them, gigantic compared to our sun. And they want me to believe that all of this was in a dot smaller than a period on a page. Satan has to be laughing at these evolutionists for believing this stuff. Can you think of anything more absurd? And then it says in the textbook, for some unknown reason, this region exploded. This explosion is called the Big Bang. Well, if you're going to get all that matter squeezed that tight, first place, that would take some kind of energy that, like we can't comprehend, okay? Why would it explode? How long did it stay in the squeezed position? And why did it explode? And where did the energy come from to make this explosion? Where did the energy come from to get it together to begin with? I mean, there's a host of questions you can ask about the Big Bang. Like, what exploded? You know, why did it explode? Where did it come from? Anyway, that's what the textbook says. For some unknown reason, this exploded. This textbook says, after many billions of years, all the matter and energy will once again be packed into a small area. This area may be no larger than the period at the end of this sentence. Then, another Big Bang will occur. The formation of a universe will begin all over again. A universe that periodically expands and then contracts back on itself is called a closed universe. In a closed universe, a Big Bang may occur once every 80 to 100 billion years. Now keep in mind, they cut down a tree to print that. You know, where's Al Gore when you need him? That's what I want to know. <laughs> he should have been hugging that tree. I, that is absolutely so dumb to believe such a thing. It exploded, it's going to come back someday and squeeze in and then explode again and it come back and explode again. Do they really honestly believe that? 
I mean, can they possibly believe such a thing? This textbook author says, nothing really means nothing. Now, you have to be at least that smart to write a book, okay? He said, not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. By the way, that's an interesting sentence, and he's right. If you have matter but have no space, where would you put it? If you have matter and space but have no time, then when would you put it? Time, space, and matter is what's called a continuum. You can't have one without the other. We went over that last week, didn't we? About the time, space, was that? Okay. You can't have one without the other. So, it, they're correct. They're saying not only, you know, nothing really means nothing. Not only is there no matter, there's no time and no space. So, the question would be, how did this get here? And the Big Bang theorists will say, well, the Big Bang, as this nothing exploded, it created time, space, and matter all simultaneously. Hmm. The textbook says, however, th physicists theorize that from this state of nothingness, <laughs> the universe began in a gigantic explosion 16.5 billion years ago. Now, by the way, the numbers for how long ago this happened float all over the scale. On the low range, I think the lowest number I've seen is 8 billion years ago was the Big Bang. On the high range, 20 billion years ago. Like this textbook I showed you a few slides ago, it says uh, 18 to 20 billion years ago, you know, there was a Big Bang. I think the currently accepted uh, uh, view now in, uh, in 2005 is that it happened 14.6 uh, billion years ago. When I debated Hugh Ross uh, at Reasons to Believe uh, in Pasadena, California, debated for three hours, he said the Big Bang was, four, I think he said something like 14.62, you know, billion years. <laughs> I said, you have got to be kidding. Do you really believe such a thing? Uh, this textbook says, the theory of the origin, this theory of the origin of the universe is called the Big Bang Theory. Now, the Big Bang Theory started by a guy named George Edward Lat uh, Lemaitre. George Lemaitre died in 1966. He's the one who invented the Big Bang Theory. When it was first invented, not too many people believed in it. Like many theories, you know, comes along and says, well, I don't believe that, and everybody, but pretty soon it came to be accepted, and now if you question the Big Bang, boy, you are, you're, you're banished academic Siberia, you know. You don't dare question the Big Bang theory. But he said, according to Isaac Asimov, uh, Lemaitre conceived this mass to be more though, mo no more than a few light years in diameter. At the very least, that would be two, right? A few light years would have to be at least two light years, okay? Well, that would be 12 trillion miles across, because a light year is about 6 trillion miles. Light travels about 6 trillion miles in one year. So he said the thing that exploded is 12 trillion light years across. That's a big dot. Then in 1965, they said, oh, no, it wasn't that big. It was only 275 million miles across. Well, that's way down. I mean, that's a whole lot smaller. Then in 1972, they said, oh, no, it's only 71 million miles. You know, the Big Bang theory, as it was taught in the textbooks in the early 70s, was there was a Big Bang, you know, 20 billion years ago, and this one mass, 70, 71 million miles across, exploded. Then in 1974, they said, oh, no, it's only 54,000 miles across. In 1983, they said it's a trillionth the diameter of a proton. Well, you figure, if you want to get a visual picture of how big an atom is, this is a neat picture, okay? How big is a grain of salt? Can you picture a grain of salt? Now I want you to take that grain of salt and expand it until it's as tall as the Empire State Building in New York, okay? Expand it in all directions. Length, width, height is still a giant cube but it's now as big as the Empire State Building. If you could expand it that much, the molecules would expand equally proportional, and they would now become as big as the original grain of salt. How many grains of salt would it take stacked on top of each other to go to the top of the Empire State Building? Several, right? That's how many molecules there are stacked up the edge of a grain of salt. Just to give you the picture. 
And salt is sodium chloride, it's a fairly good size, you know, molecule compared to other molecules like hydrogen or helium. They're even a lot smaller than that, okay? So a grain of salt expanded to the size of the Empire State Building would now make the molecules become the size of the original grain of salt, just to give you a visual image of how tiny molecules are. Now in that molecule you have atoms, and in that atom you have protons, which are unbelievably tiny. And so this, in 1983, they began teaching that the thing that exploded was a trillionth the diameter of a proton. You can't even picture how tiny something like that would be. And then, of course, now, they said, oh, it was smaller than that. It was nothing. No nothing exploded and produced everything. I think this shows a classic example of how once you start to believe something stupid, you'll believe anything. Once you start to believe, you know, we came from a monkey. Oh, maybe we came from a, a, a squirrel. Maybe we came from a rock. Well, maybe we came from nothing. It's a slippery slope, okay? Once you start down that slope, you're going to end up all the way at the bottom, okay? And you're going to bump every dumb stick on the way down the, down the hill as you roll down. Uh, <laughs> how absurd can you get? Here's a Discover magazine a couple years ago. Where did everything come from? Now watch this. Cover page, okay? Front cover. It says, the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing, zero, nada. As it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. How is that possible? Ask Alan Guth. His theory of inflation helps explain everything. Well, I, I got to meet this Alan Guth, okay? Alan Guth said in Scientific American, Clear back in 1996, he said, the observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. It's then, by the way, that's a dot in the Hebrew there. Uh, it's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. You see, boys and girls, we all came from a dot, and the dot came from nothing. There has to be, I still haven't, if you can help me on this, I'd need some help on this. I cannot figure out a way to help the evolutionists see how dumb that is. How can you help somebody see what you believe is just, that's real dumb. We all came from nothing. But see, what does that teaching do if you stop and think about it? If we really came from nothing which exploded, then how, how can you have morals? How can anything be right or wrong? I've asked evolutionists that question all over the world. Simple question. If your theory is true, if evolution is true, how do you tell right from wrong? They simply cannot answer the question. Because if that's how we got here, I mean, does nothing have morals? Does matter have morals? Does matter have rules, you know? I mean, it's such a dumb theory. We all came from nothing. I asked a professor on the plane, I said, well, sir, I don't understand this Big Bang Theory. Explain this to me. He said, well, 20 billion years ago, all the material in the universe was concentrated in one little tiny dot, smaller than a period on a page, and it was spinning. I like this text, this textbook says, it's, as the nebula shrank, it spun faster and faster. This is a essential point here now because everything that we see in the universe is spinning. Even the molecules are spinning, right? Everything is spinning. Uh, the world is spinning. The planets are spinning. The universe, the galaxies are spinning. The, uh, everything's spinning. The solar system is spinning. So where did this spin come from? They either, ha they have two choices. The initial object was spinning, and therefore, poof, all the fragments are spinning, or each of them picked up a spin on their own. Now, that would be a serious problem, to say every single, th every single thing picked up this spin. From where? It's much easier, and I've never met anybody argue about this one, it's much easier to say, well, the initial object must have been spinning. That's what they teach in the textbooks. This nebula began to rotate. It spun faster and faster. 
But gradually, the spinning nebula flattened into a huge disk almost 10 billion kilometers across. At the center of the disk, a growing protosun, or new sun, began to take shape. As the gas cloud continued to collapse toward its center, the protosun grew more and more massive. Now right there, this is absolute stupidity when it comes to science. Gas clouds don't condense because of their own gravity. Are you afraid when you go out there that a cloud is going to condense into a solid material and fall on you? Anybody ever been hit by a falling cloud? <laughs> it doesn't happen. Clouds of gas and dust expand. What's going to squeeze them together to make a solid? It takes enormous energy for this to happen. Ah, I asked a professor one time, I said, you know, you say stars form from clouds of dust. Hello, this doesn't happen. How you, it's what's called Boyle's Gas Law. Write that down. That'll be a good quiz question. Boyle, B-O-Y-L-E. Boyle de de studied how gases behave. What happens when you try to compress a gas? It heats up. Enormous heat. When you take compressed gas and you release the pressure, now it absorbs heat, so the can gets cold. How many ever sprayed a spray can, you know, and the can gets cold? You spray it for a while, the can starts to get cold. When you release the, that's how an air compressor, an air conditioner works. John, when you use compressed gases like, you know, stuff for your welding, you know, while you're, if you're releasing the pressure out of those cylinders, first it took an enormous amount of energy to squeeze that gas into that cylinder. And it's still in a gas condition. Sometimes it condenses it to a liquid, like liquefied propane, but to squeeze something to a solid would require absolutely phenomenal amounts of pressure. So where's this energy going to come from? So this professor was talking about, you know, how clouds form from, you know, dust that got together and collapsed. I said, wait, wait, wait. How do you overcome Boyle's gas law? Boyle said, as you try to compress a gas, it's going to build up heat, which is going to drive it back away. If you just take gas, let's take a balloon as an example, and you heat it up, what happens? It expands. When you cool it down, it contracts. You can take a balloon, blow it up, tie it, stick it in the freezer. <coughs> Come back in 20 minutes, it'll be this big. It'll shrink way down. Take a balloon, blow it up, measure the diameter, and then hold it in the sun for a while, or let it heat up somehow. It'll get bigger. It's just the way it is. That's the way a hot air balloon works. You know, they tie the basket on the bottom and they got a furnace in there and they, they heat up the air. Hot air expands and is therefore lighter and it rises. When they run out of gas, they, you know, the hot air balloon starts coming back down. Well, I asked the professor, I said, how can you get gas to condense into a solid and make a star? He said, well, we've calculated that if 20 stars explode near each other, it'll produce enough energy to produce a brand new star. <laughs> so think about what you're saying. You have to lose 20 to gain one. Doesn't that sound like some kind of losing proposition here? I said, man, you ought to run for Congress. You could help those guys borrow their way out of debt. <laughs> Let's borrow another million dollars to pay off these bills. Well, duh. <laughs> think about it, okay? Um, by the way, it's pure theoretical. I don't know if 20 stars exploding could produce enough energy to make a new star. Okay, that's never been observed. That's just theoretical. But even if it did, that's... How are you going to explain the 70 sextillion stars we have? It means you'd have to have 140, you know, uh, what? 1.4... 70 times 20. Yeah. 140 sextillion. No, more than that. That's two. Yeah. One point, I can't think in my head. Uh, sec, septillion. You'd have to have 1.4 septillion stars exploding to end up with, you know, one twentieth as many now. It's such a dumb idea. And I, I feel sorry for people who believe that. I mean, I really do. It's so easy to make fun of them. And it's, it's actually fun to make fun of them. And I enjoy it. I just have to confess, I enjoy making fun of evolutionists. But it is sad that they're so blinded, you know. I'm sure Elijah, you know, was enjoying himself, making fun of the prophets of Baal, you know. Why don't you cry a little louder? Maybe he's sleeping, you know. Because he knew how dumb it was to worship a statue. 
These guys, they carve their own statue, coat it with gold, set it up in the temple. Oh, thank you for creating us. <laughs> uh, idiot, you created him. He didn't create you. <laughs> and Satan has to be laughing at these guys for believing this, but I feel sorry for him. I mean, I really do. I want to try to win him to the Lord. And people say, Brother Hovind, you're sarcastic. And, you know, well, I know. I got kind of the Elijah personality. You know, I'm sorry about that. I'm not trying to change it, but, you know which means I'm probably not really sorry about it, but I'm having a good time, actually, making fun of them. But they really need help, okay? Um, and we want to win them. But see, I'm a little bit hard on them precisely because they are destroying the faith of so many kids coming through their class. You know, people say, why are you, you know, hard on the evolutionists? I say, well, if I was, you know, going into Germany to rescue some of the Jews in a concentration camp, I would have a hard time being nice to Hitler's guards. You know what I mean? I mean, excuse me, guys, would you please not be mean to these Jews? I would like to bring them out of here. You know, would you guys put your guns down, please? No, they're probably not going to put their guns down. They're probably going to have to, you know, explain it to them in a language they can understand, right? And the professors who are destroying the faith of these kids coming through their class and who are mocking Christianity at my expense, you know, I'm paying their salary while they mock my God. I just have a hard time, you know, taking that laying down and, you know, being sweet about it. So if you don't like my caustic personality, well, then you go do it a different way, okay? You go in there and lovingly, you know, win them over. Whatever you want to do, I don't care. Just do it, okay? Get the job done, right? Jack Hiles, I'm preaching up there at First Baptist Hammond in a couple of weeks. Jack Hiles was pastor there for years and years. Uh, this lady came to him afterwards. She said, I don't like the way you win souls. He said, well, how do you do it? She said, well, I don't do it. <laughs> he said, oh, well, I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. That's for sure, you know? So I don't always like my way of dealing with the evolutionists, okay? But at least I deal with them. You know, these people that are critical say you shouldn't be, you know, sarcastic. Okay, well, how do you, how do you win them? Well, I don't. Okay, well, then I win some, and I certainly anger the rest. And sometimes that's a start. You've got to get them mad before they get glad, you know? I have them write to me and say, you know, I watched your tapes, and I hated you so much. And they just ate at me and ate at me. And I realized, wow, he's right, you know? I better get right with God, so... Sometimes that's the way seeds work. You know, you've got to break the ground to get, it to get it to get growing. So anyway, the textbooks will teach, and this is correct, that if the Big Bang Theory is true, the initial object had to be spinning. Well, this creates a problem. It creates a problem if it wasn't spinning. It creates a different problem if it was spinning. If it wasn't spinning and it just exploded, then how did all of the particles, clear down to the atoms, pick up a spin? If it was spinning, you got another big problem because uh, of well, the law of conservation of angular momentum. Okay, we'll get into that in a second. But according to the creationist view, 6,000 years ago, God created everything. And according to the evolutionist view, 20 billion years ago, nothing exploded and made everything. Both views assume a beginning. That's a given. Okay? The only one textbook that I saw that tried to get around this problem is the one that says maybe it expands and every, every 20, 80, 80 billion years, you know, it, it contracts and blows, floats again. What they're doing, the one I showed you a minute ago, they're implying then that matter is eternal. And we know matter cannot be eternal. We'll get into that in a minute. So the creationists believe, you know, in the beginning, God. And the evolutionists believe all the material in the universe was in one little tiny dot. You know, all the dirt in the universe was squeezed in this dot and it exploded. And they believe, you know, in the beginning, dirt. So one of the problems you have is the news media and the textbooks and the teachers and even people that call into my radio program every day on, on drdino.com, they always try to assume that evolution is part of science. When I did a debate in El Paso, Texas, uh, Roger O'Dell set up the thing there for me to have the debate in El Paso. And, uh, Here's the article they ran in El Paso Times. Religious and scientific leaders debate evolution. Now just think about the headline. What are they trying to imply just by the headline? That evolution is part of science. And I stop them every time I can. Oh, wait, 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 no, guys, no, no. Science deals with things we can observe, study, and test. We don't observe any of the evolution claims. You can believe that if you'd like, but that's not observed. It's not religious and scientific leaders debating evolution. It is two religions 
debating. Evolution is a religion. They get very angry when I say that. And Jonathan does a radio program, and you know they call in, and they're mad about that. It's not a religion. Yes, it is. In every sense of the word, it's something you have to believe in. There's no observation. There's no testing. There's no experimentation. It's simply a religious belief. But I, I see this over and over and over again in the textbooks and in the, in the debates, you know. They keep saying, well, you know, according to science, you know, we know science is different than religion. I say, wait, wait, are you implying that evolution ought to be with science? Right there's your mistake. I would agree that science and religion are different. But I would not agree that evolution should be included with science. And you're going to have to stop them every, every five minutes. So wait, wait, there you go again. You're trying to include evolution as part of science. They want to sneak it in. Here's the illustration I use. I say, beer is sold at football games quite often. Beer has nothing to do with football. And beer does not become athletic by association with football. Okay? And evolution has nothing to do with science, and it doesn't become scientific by being associated with, you know, with science. It's true it's mixed in the textbooks. It's true beer is mixed in at football games. So what? It doesn't mean there's a connection between the two. Religious and scientific leaders debate evolution. That's baloney. See, the evolution and creation are both religious worldviews. The difference is the evolution religion is tax supported. That's one of the, one of the ma many major differences. All of us are paying for that religion to be taught. They'll say, we should, can't have religion in schools. I say, well, sure, you, first place, it's not what the Constitution says. It's not what the Founding Fathers intended. It's not how the school started off, okay? But, and it's not true. We have all kinds of religion in school. We just don't have Christianity in school. It's not religion they're against. It's Christianity specifically that they're against, okay? These two timelines are the same thing behind the screen here, and I use these in my seminars over and over. You can get these at our, on our website, Dr. Dino, a copy of these. On the top timeline, I drew it so one inch would equal 150 years. 150 years is a long time. What took place 150 years ago? Who can think of something? 1855. Uh, before the Civil War, quite a few Indian battles going on. Some people trying to win the Indians. Most people trying to just steal their stuff, you know. Uh, but some people tried to actually win them to the Lord. But, you know, the Industrial Revolution. You go back and make a list of all the things America did not have, or the world did not have. Electricity, cars, you know. And it, just 150 years ago. That's a long time. Abe Lincoln wasn't even president one inch ago on our chart. But if I tried to make the 20 billion year chart to be the same scale, to show you 20 billion years at the top scale of an inch to 150 years, just the chart would have to be from Pensacola to Portland, Oregon, 2,100 miles, or Toronto, Canada to San Diego. That's a long ways. And I don't want to carry a chart that big, so I made a new scale. Anyway, this professor on the plane answered my questions about time, space, matter. We'll cover that in just a minute after our break here. But um, The questions that you need to ask people when they say the Big Bang, you've got to stop them right there. Explain this 20 billion years ago to me. Okay, where did time, space, matter come from, the laws? We'll get into all that right after a quick break here. Coming up a couple minutes, all right? Okay, let's take up where we left off. Some of the problems with the Big Bang Theory. The problems are multiple, okay? Not only theoretical problems, but actual scientific problems with this theory. Number one, where did the matter come from? What exploded? They'll say, well, nothing exploded. Well, then, then you don't have an explosion. You get, you, if nothing explodes, you have, you have nothing. You know? You can't even visualize what they're trying to say here. You know? They kept getting that dot smaller and smaller until now it's nothing that exploded. That simply doesn't make sense. Does it make sense to anybody here? So I asked the professor, I said, where did the matter come from for the Big Bang? He said, we don't know. I said, where did the laws come from? All of the universe is governed by laws. We have the law of gravity, centrifugal force, inertia, uh, Boyle's law, the gas laws. There are all kinds of laws that govern the universe. You know, we have Cole's law. You can eat that with potato salad, okay? Uh, and I'm always asking the people, uh, why aren't the laws still evolving? You ever think about that? Why is gravity always the same? Why don't you weigh 10 pounds more one day? 
You say, well, I do. Well, that's for other reasons, okay? But the laws didn't change, okay? Your diet might have changed, but the laws are consistent. Now, if nothing exploded and made everything, it not only has to make the matter for the universe, it has to make the laws. Is gravity just built into matter? I mean, how can you explain that? Was gravity, where was gravity before the Big Bang? And if everything squeezed into a dot, what squeezed it in? Well, gravity. Oh, then gravity was already there. Were the laws created by the Big Bang? It's a serious problem. Okay? And where did the energy come from? You have to have matter and or energy to create this. Big bangs produce big messes. And then I asked the professor, he did, not, he did not know any of those. So I said, well, sir, <coughs> does Berkeley have a merry-go-round? You all know what a merry-go-round is, right? He said, no, we don't have a merry-go-round. We had a good long, we had a three-hour flight, you know, from Dallas to San Francisco. So we had a good long flight. And I asked him some several questions. I said, now, if you put some fourth graders on a merry-go-round and you get the high school football team to get it spinning clockwise as fast as it'll go, you notice some very interesting phenomena. And when I do the seminar, I say, how many of you are in fourth grade, you know, and some kids raise their hand, and I say, oh, great, I spent the best five years of my life in the fourth grade, you know. I try to use a lot of humor, humor in my seminar. Number one, that's my personality. Number two, it keeps, keeps it lively, keeps people awake, and uh, it makes a heavy subject seem easier. Humor is a good, also a good anesthetic under which you can do surgery. You get somebody laughing while you cut out their sin, you know. Oh, isn't that funny? Yeah, smoking. Uh, oh, smoking. Oh, yeah. You know. And you work on their sin under all their, under anesthetic, i.e., laughter. But if this uh, is a fact, if you put some kids on a merry-go-round and get it spinning clockwise, they will go through four phases. They start off in phase one. They're screaming, you know, faster, faster. You get up around 30 miles an hour. They go to phase two, where they stop screaming and they're just quietly concentrating on trying to hang on. You get up at 60 miles an hour. They enter phase three, where they're screaming again. You know, stop, stop, please slow down. Somewhere between there and 100 miles an hour, you'll enter phase four, where the kids begin to fly off the merry-go-round. Now, if you watch them carefully, as the kid flies off, he will be spinning clockwise. If the merry-go-round is going clockwise, he will be spinning clockwise because of a law called, until he encounters res resistance, of course, because of a law called the conservation of angular momentum. There are many things that happen with a spinning object. You can try this on our merry-go-round here at Dinosaur Adventure Land, okay? Get 10 kids on the merry-go-round, have them lean way back to the outside, and get it spinning. And then say, okay, kids, when I say three, I want you to lean to the middle. Just lean in as far as you can. Let's say it is turning, for sake of illustration, one revolution every second. When they lean into the middle, it'll pick up to three or four revolutions per second. It'll greatly increase the speed, assuming no friction, which, by the way, we've got a lot of friction. That bearing is, yeah, grease that bearing up there. But if you get a frictionless or a near frictionless merry-go-round, uh, that's one of the laws. As you concentrate the mass toward the center, the velocity picks up. How many have ever seen ice skaters, you know, when they're doing that thing and they pull their arms in, whoosh, spin real fast, stick their arms out and slow down? When you're diving, you know, you tuck real tight to do a flip. As soon as you straighten out, you stop flipping hopefully at the right time to not land in a belly flop. But, um, well, spinning objects have certain rules that they simply follow, one of which is the conservation of angular momentum. A spinning object in a frictionless environment, now this will only work in a frictionless environment, which is what the Big Bang would be because all the matter was in one spot. So when it exploded, <coughs> all the pieces, if the original object is spinning clockwise, all of the pieces would spin clockwise. The evolutionists will say, well, these, these things are spinning backwards because they collided with something. I'll say, that's not possible. If an explosion takes place, let's say you've got a hand grenade. All the fragments go flying off like spokes on a wheel. Is it possible, if you drop a hand grenade in a field, for the fragments to fly off and hit each other someplace out in the field further out? No. The longer you wait, the further apart they get. It is just not possible for them to hit each other out there in the field someplace. So it's just, I would say, that's not logical, okay? To say the fragments collided is, is not, it's not physically possible. But the conservation of angular momentum is interesting. Here's a couple of quotes you might want to read about this. This angular momentum would have caused the sun to spin very rapidly.
Actually, our sun spins very slowly, while the planets move very rapidly around the sun. In fact, although the sun has over 99% of the mass of the solar system, it has only 2% of the angular momentum. Let me stop and explain here in case you don't know. There's a difference between mass and weight, okay? Your mass does not change. If you went out into space, you're, you would still have the same mass, even though you would feel like you weighed nothing. But if a 300-pound guy and a 50-pound kid collide in space, it's going to have the same effect as if they collided on Earth. They're going to boing, bounce off, and the 50-pound kid's going to go flying. It's like a BB hitting a freight train, okay? Uh, the mass doesn't change. It's how much material you, ha material you have, okay? That's not going to change. So the sun has 99% of the mass of the solar system, but only 2% of the angular momentum. This pattern is directly opposite to the pattern predicted from the nebular hypothesis. It's been known for years that the whole Big Bang Theory violates numerous laws of science, okay? Here's why they haven't given up on it. They don't have a replacement. They don't have a new theory to explain the universe, so we're going to keep the Big Bang. Here's the logic behind that. You got a guy in jail. You think he's guilty of the crime. Then you find evidence that he is, there's no possible way he can be guilty. Okay? He wasn't there. He was 300 miles away. 50 people saw him. But you still don't know who did the crime. So we're going to keep this guy in jail until we find the person who did it. You see how dumb that would be? We know he didn't do it, but we don't know who did, so we're keeping him until we find out who did. That's what they're doing with this Big Bang Theory. Scientists who study this will say, look, we know it's not true, but we don't have a better explanation. So we're going to hang on to this one until the new one comes along. Because nature abhors a vacuum, okay? If, you, if there's a vacuum, something's going to try, everything's going to try to get into it. And if you, have a, if you don't have a theory for the explanation of the world, well then, that's just unacceptable. We have to have a theory. And I've had evolutionists get mad and say, well, the Big Bang Theory is not part of evolution. Oh, you're crazy. It's an essential part of evolution. What evolved? Where did it come from? You have to have a consistent, coherent theory starting from the beginning. They, they, they're always trying with me now to say, well, ma evolution only deals with living things. I said, well, you're going to skip the vital parts of where did matter come from, where did energy come from, where did life get started, stuff like that? Yeah, they really want to skip all that because there simply is no explanation. Okay, well then you don't have a coherent theory is my point. Look at this next quote. The ultimate origin of the solar system's angular momentum remains obscure. That's a polite way of saying we have no idea how it got this way. It remains obscure. In other words, we don't know. <laughs> Why don't you just say it clearly where fourth graders can get it? Okay? We don't know. Bottom quote. One of the detailed problems is then to explain how the sun still acquires nearly 99.9% .9 of the mass of the solar system, but only 2% of its angular momentum. This was a 1969 textbook. This problem has been known for decades. What do they do about it? Ignore it. They don't have an answer. I asked the professor on the plane, I said, Sir, if everything began from a swirling dot, you know, Big Bang, why do two planets, and possibly Pluto would be number three, rotate backwards? I don't know if it's ever been demonstrated or not if Pluto rotates backwards to the rest, okay? All the planets are going the same direction around the sun, but some of them are spinning backwards. Why? And their answer is, oh, they got hit by something. I say, that's not possible. Not if the Big Bang Theory is true. What would hit them? The longer you wait, the farther apart they're going to get. Also, eight of the 91 known moons, I believe now there might be over 100 moons that have been discovered. I don't know. But according to Walt Brown's website, creationscience.com, by the way, a great website, you ought to check. Walt Brown was a physics professor for the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. He has a PhD in physics. Has a, he's a Christian, uh, travels and speaks on creation, has a great book out that we sell in the beginning by Walt Brown, the book we sell in our library, powerful book. Uh, I disagree with Walt on a couple of key things, okay, but that's, I've learned to eat the meat and spit out the bones years ago. If you don't learn that, you will choke on something, okay. <laughs> so, but 
Uh, he's, he's the one that said eight of the 91 known moons spin backwards, and I believe now there are maybe over, over 100 moons. It doesn't matter. Hmm? Creationscience.com. He lives in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, great guy. He's, he's all military. I mean, he's a retired Air Force colonel, okay? And it's, you know, he's, he's all military when you talk to him, you know? Just kind of... <laughs> doesn't know how to lighten up a little bit. But uh, down under the tough skin, you know, like the guy on the TV program, Gunny, you know, he's, he's really a person in there. Uh, but Saturn, Jupiter, and Neptune are very interesting planets. They all have quite a few moons going around them. But they have moons, think about it, going both directions. How could a Big Bang produce a planet with moons going opposite directions? And how long could moons going the opposite directions survive? Isn't there some kind of probability that they would eventually, you know, hit each other? Is a system like that possible for billions of years, or is there some kind of shorter time limit to this? I don't know that anybody's ever studied the probability of the planets or the planets' moons hitting each other. I know there are slightly different orbits, etc. But uh, to me, it looked like this would, this would be an indication that it cannot be billions of years old. But anyway, the fact is three planets have moons orbiting both directions. The sun is 98% hydrogen or helium. The inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, are less than 1% hydrogen or helium. If it came from a Big Bang, don't you think there ought to be a little better consistency of what the things are formed of? Why are the inner planets so different from the Sun? And so different from each other? All nine planets are very different. I mean, very different. Some are just gas, some are solid. Uh, my daughter bought her first car from a guy. I spoke at a church in Connecticut, and he drove me around while I was speaking at the church. He was the uh, person assigned to take me around when I needed somewhere. And he had this little Mercury Sable. And a sharp little car, you know. And I said, hey, my daughter turned 16. She's looking for a car. Uh, do you like this Sable? He said, yeah, I'm good. He said, it's, a, it's been a lemon. I've replaced everything on it. You know, my mechanic said, I've replaced everything you can replace on that car. He said, that thing ought to run for 4,000 years now, you know. So. He said, it was a lemon, but we think we, you know, squeezed the juice out of it, and it's fine now. Bottom line is, he drove it down here to Mississippi. He was coming anyway, and my daughter bought it and drove it. It was her first car. Who cares? Well, this guy, I said, what do you do for a living? He said, I work for, I forget the name of the company. He said, but we manufacture parachutes that are designed to go into hostile environments like Venus. I said, really? He said, yeah, when they send space probes up, they want to drop this thing off into the planet's atmosphere. Well, it has to have a parachute to slow it down. But the gases that it's going through are, are caustic, and they eat up the material. What we do is we run all the math on how big is this planet, how much gravity does it have, how fast is this thing going to fall, and how, much, how thick is the atmosphere, and you know, blah, 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 run all, run all the numbers on it. And we calculate how big our parachute has to be and what kind of material it has to be made out of to survive long enough to slow our thing down so it doesn't break when it hits the ground. We count on the parachute dissolving as it goes through this gas, because it's going to dissolve. You know, the chlorine and stuff just dissolves the parachute. But if it'll last, you know, for 37 seconds, it's got, you know, that's long enough. And they build the parachutes in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. He said, I work for the company that designs them. Who cares? Well, the point is, it's been long known that these planets have very different atmospheres and have very different makeup. Something is very different. Well, I heard, I don't know, I haven't documented this, maybe somebody can do it for me, but I was told that when they brought back moon rocks, they analyzed them and said they're 30% silica, like the beach, at the Pensacola Beach, you know, the sand. And then they said it appears like the moon, you know, silica is highly reflective. They said it appears that the moon was designed to be a reflector. I could have told them that. <laughs> it's exactly correct, okay? The moon was designed to be a reflector. It's highly... But anyway, the point is, the planets are different material. Now, if they all came from the same dot that exploded, don't you think there'd be a little more consistency in what they are made of? Why aren't they all similar? Some galaxies are spinning backwards. This becomes a real serious problem for evolutionists. CNN ran an article in uh, 2002. 
Goofy Galaxy spins in wrong direction. <laughs> it's known they should all spin the same way, but here we got problems. For the, I think there's serious problems for the Big Bang Theory. Some planets spin backwards. Some moons spin backwards. Three planets have moons go in both directions. Some whole galaxies spin backwards. The planets are made of different materials. I mean, it's all the same 98 elements, but the concentration of elements is vastly different. How could this happen from a common Big Bang? The professor said, I don't know. How do you think it happened? I was, of course, I was hoping he was going to ask that. You know. I said, well, sir, it's very simple. You see, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And God did it that way on purpose just to make the Big Bang Theory look stupid. And it is. It's stupid for multiple reasons, okay? Scientifically, just simply cognitively, you can't even imagine such a thing, okay? It has even conceptual problems. You can't even conceive how, you can't even think about how this could happen. The Bible, I say, teaches the Big Bang. Um, in 2 Peter 3, it says, The heavens shall pass away with a great noise. In the original Greek, that's a big bang. So somebody says, do you believe in the Big Bang? I say, oh yeah, you better get saved and get ready for it. You know, the Big Bang is coming soon to a city near you. Uh, people say, do you believe in global warming? Oh yeah, Revelation says they were scorched with a fervent heat. You know, there's going to be global warming. Yep, coming soon. You better get saved and get ready for that. By the way, if the Big Bang Theory is true, <clears throat> would there be any purpose for God to send His Son to die for a world that evolved here by chance and came from a Big Bang? Where does the death of Christ fit into this? Well, there are many evolutionists who know full well that the, the death of Christ is unnecessary. And, I mean, if the Big Bang Theory is true, and that's one of the purposes of this evolution theory, is to <clears throat> eliminate the need for salvation. Think about it. If evolution is true, what do we need to be saved from? The devotion my son gave the other day was really, that's some good thoughts in there, you know. Salvation from what? What is sin? I mean, if evolution is true, what is sin? There is no such thing as sin. Saved from what? When I was lifeguard, you know, we had a, we had a camp one time, a Salvation Army camp, where I was the lifeguard at for two summers. Um, and there are all these campers, kids, I think they had 300 kids at a time or something at this camp. Well, one time, a whole bunch of little black kids came, all eight, nine, ten-year-olds. You know, the whole camp is swarming with these little black kids. Had a, had a, we had a blast. I love that. And uh, I was teaching the kids how to do a flip off the diving board. You know, so these kids are all lined up, and I do the flip, you know, tuck in tight, and you know, all this kind of stuff, bounce, lean forward. <clears throat> well, this one little kid jumped off the diving board and did a nice flip. And he comes up in the you know, pool and he's smiling, laughing around, you know, big old white teeth showing every place. He's looking around, you know, smiling, splashing, and he went back down. He came up again, he's smiling, looking around, and the kid said, hey, get him out of there, it's my turn to dive. I said, Sammy, get out of there, the next kid wants to dive, move over. He smiled, looked around, went back down. One of the kids in the line said, is that Sammy? He can't swim, what's he doing in the deep end? You know? He came up the third time, he smiled and looking around, splashing like mad. I said, Sammy, are you drowning? <laughs> so I jumped in and grabbed him and pulled him out. But see, he apparently didn't realize he needed to be saved. All right? One preacher was uh, walking out of the barber shop one time, and one of the local skeptics in town hollered across the street and said, Hey, preacher, you trying to get people saved? He said, No, nope, I'm trying to get people lost. If you get them to realize they're lost, the rest is easy. Nathan, did you call the doctor today? Why not? Didn't realize I needed to. Didn't realize you needed to. You don't feel sick, right? Now, if you wake up tomorrow morning and your blood's pouring out your ear and your pillow is soaked in blood, you're probably going to think, you know, this is not right. I probably should have this looked at, you know. I think I better call somebody who might know what this problem is, okay? You have first have to realize there's a problem before you're even going to call for the doctor. And you have to think you're drowned in before you call for the lifeguard. And you're going to have to realize you're lost before you're going to call for the Savior. That's why I like Ray Comfort's approach on soul winning. It's classic. You know, get them lost. Show them the law. Oh, yeah. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And say, ever, you're a good person. Oh, yeah, I'm a good person. You ever lied? Well, yeah. What's that make you? Well... I'm a liar. Have you ever stolen anything? 
Well, y yeah. What's that make you? Well, it wasn't a big, well, it's, you're a thief. Oh, okay. You ever lusted? Uh, yeah. Well, the Bible says, you know, if you even lust, you're an adulterer at heart. Uh, you ever hated anybody? Yeah, yeah. Well, the Bible says if you hate somebody, it's like murder. Are you a good person? Yeah, I'm a good person. You already told me you're a lion, thief, and adulterer, and murderer at heart, and now you're telling me you're a good person? <laughs> Once you get them lost, the rest is easy. They'll come running for the Savior. Uh, who was the uh, fam famous sermon in Connecticut? I stood on the spot where he preached it. You know, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by uh, Jonathan Edwards. Brain fade there. Up in Connecticut, they got this little marker on the side of the road where he preached that sermon. Okay, so we stopped there and looked at that thing. Jonathan Edwards, there were dozens of people praying round the clock for Jonathan Edwards. He, he read the entire sermon. He had glasses about that thick, okay? Real, real bad eyesight. The whole sermon was printed out. He's standing there reading the sermon, okay? That far away from it. He's reading the whole thing. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. <laughs> if you haven't read it, it's incredible, okay? You got to read that. While he was reading this sermon in the church, the people were gripping the pews, leaving their fingernail marks in the pews. They were scared stiff. He said, you are like a spider hanging by a thread over the flame, over the fire. And God is ready and anxious to throw you into the fire. He hates your sin, you know. He despises you like you would despise a spider. And he just goes, it was powerful, powerful sermon. People came running down the aisle, screaming and crying, I've got to get saved, you know, I want to get saved. Because he got them lost first. The whole cause of, all of Christianity is useless if the Big Bang Theory is true. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, what if an evolutionist says that God gave us these rules later on once we were already evolved? If God introduced the rules later, after we evolved? Yeah, don't do this, don't do that. First of all, I would say that's not what the Bible teaches. Secondly, there's no scientific evidence for evolution anyway, so why would we compromise a good Bible with a dumb theory? That's what I would tell them. There are lots of folks who believe, you know, that uh, like Hugh Ross and these guys, and it's amazing how many theistic evolutionists are very popular in the news, you know, uh, and on TV, Christian TV programs. But there are some who would say, that, you know, God, uh, there are some who say that God evolved. Here's another bigger picture to think about. If, if the Big Bang Theory and evolution is true, then man created God instead of God created man. Right? And that's what they teach in sociology class. You know, we used to be hunters and gatherers and slowly got together and built cities and then they created gods to worship to explain how we got here. Man created God. The Bible says just the opposite. So anyway, the death of Christ, all of Christianity is useless and unnecessary if Big Bang Theory is true. Now, the Big Bang Theory is a big dud. Here's mo another reason why the Big Bang Theory is not true. If the Big Bang Theory were true, the matter would be evenly distributed throughout the universe. It is not. There are big lumps of matter called galaxies and stars, and then there's bazillions of miles of nothing. Think about it. The sun is 880,000 miles in diameter. That's less than 1 million miles in diameter. It is 93 million miles to the sun. So between us and the sun, we got two little bitty planets going around, mounting to nearly nothing. 93 million miles of radius for this massive sphere of nothing. The matter should be evenly distributed. Well, this has led the Big Bang theorists to come up with an ex explanation for why isn't the matter evenly distributed. And they will say, well, there's a couple answers they give to that. Number one, they'll say it is dark matter. You can't see it. Oh. Okay. Some people say, well, there's antimatter. How many have ever heard of that before? Matter and antimatter. The purpose is to try to explain the missing matter in space because it's not evenly distributed. Or they'll say there are black holes. And how would you see a black hole? Well, see, you can't see them. That proves they're there. Oh, I see. <laughs> you know, you know what, what proves they're there? The need for them to be there. The Big Bang Theory's got some serious flaws. Since the matter is not evenly distributed, they're searching desperately for some way to say, well, it's because we can't see it, it's dark matter, antimatter, or matter pops in and out of existence, you know, uh, quarks and what do they call them? Uh, 
not gluons, they've got another term for it. But all of those, I think, are desperate attempts to try to explain the missing matter in space. The Big Bang Theory has a good explanation in a book called uh, The Evolution Cruncher. This is a book we sell. It's 900 pages and it's five bucks. Power, it's got a chapter on everything, okay? Fred Hoyle, the famous astronomer from Cambridge University in England, said, I have little hesitation in saying that a sickly pall now hangs over the Big Bang Theory. That was back in 84. They've known for 20 years the Big Bang Theory has serious, I would say, irreconcilable problems. Why haven't they thrown it out? They don't have a replacement yet. We're going to keep that guy in jail until we find who did it. That's not science. I get the book, The Evolution Cruncher, go to page 68, there's a whole bunch uh, on, that, on the Big Bang Theory in there. Now the second law of thermodynamics tells us everything tends toward disorder. Everything is falling apart. Most of you have a job because of the second law of thermodynamics. You're either fixing something that's broke most of the time, or cleaning something that got dirty, or you are building a new one to replace the one that's too far gone. I mean, if you think about it, probably everybody's job is here because of the second law of thermodynamics. Just about everybody's job. The farmers have to do their work because they've got to raise new food because the last food you ate is going to be gone in a few hours and you're going to be hungry again. The cleaning lady's got to come back and clean the place. We've got to build a new building every 50 or 100 years because the older ones are going to wear out and fall apart. You've got to buy a new car. You work hard to earn enough money to buy a new car. Why? Well, because the last one is worn out. You've got to buy new tires. You know, second law of thermodynamics is, is just a universal law. First law says matter cannot be created or destroyed. Second law says everything tends toward disorder. Well, there's a lot of ways to phrase the second law. I'll give you a couple other ways to phrase it in a second. But Hebrews 1 tells us, The heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish. They wax old as doth a garment. Everything is wearing out. Take a look at your hairdo when you wake up in the morning. It'll, it'll work, okay? Everything is falling apart. I've often tried to figure this out. Maybe you guys can help me on this. All right, Diane, maybe you can help me. Uh, you're a lady here. Why does it take the women an hour of hard work in the morning in order to look natural? <laughs> Think about it. I want to look natural. Well, then get up and go to work, okay? <laughs> That's natural, okay? Everything is falling apart, folks. Nothing's getting better by itself. Here's Sue at 20. There she is at 90. And here she is at 3,000. Okay? I mean, everything is falling apart. Isaac Asimov, uh, a very famous anti-creationist uh, and anti-Christian, he said, another way of stating the second law is, the universe is constantly getting more disorderly. Viewed that way, we can see the second law all about us. We have to work hard to straighten out a room, but left to itself, it becomes a mess again, very quickly and very easily. Even if we never enter it, it becomes dusty and musty. How difficult to maintain houses and machinery and our own bodies in perfect working order. How easy to let them deteriorate. In fact, all we have to do is nothing. And everything deteriorates, collapses, breaks down, wears out, all by itself. And that is what the second law is all about. And he's right. And yet this guy still turns around and believes in evolution. I, I just can't comprehend that. This is a thermograph of a building showing where the heat is being lost from. You heat up your house, the heat leaves, doesn't it? And you've got to pay to heat it again. Or when you cool the house, you've got to pay to cool it again. It's amazing how much of our uh, budget goes to replacing things. Replacing light bulbs, replacing heat, replacing cold air, you know, because of the second law of thermodynamics. But in spite of that, the textbooks still teach, like this one here, humanists probably evolved from bacteria more than four billion years ago. Here's a question you can ask evolutionists. You know, they say we came from a single-celled creature, like a bacteria. Where are the two-celled creatures in the world? 
Did they go straight from one cell to, you know, hundreds of cells together acting as an organism? Where are the two-celled creatures? Well, there aren't any. Not only there aren't any, there aren't any fossils of any. Nobody's ever found a fossil of a two-celled creature. Where are they? They don't exist. They never existed. And because it didn't happen. Now, see, that's the logical event, it's, you know, logical sequence to think through this. You'd say, well, we don't find any evidence. There's none alive today. There's no fossils, so it didn't happen. But they will say, we don't have any evidence. We don't have them today. Uh, we don't find any fossils of them because we haven't looked hard enough. It's not science. The evolutionists will assume that if you add energy, you can overcome the second law. And I get this all the time. They'll say, well, Hoban, the second law only applies in a closed system. They'll say, can't you come in and straighten out a room? You can add energy and increase the order. Yes, I can. You can walk in and straighten up the library. Yep, I can add energy and overcome the second law. But the universe is a closed system. Here's the argument they're going to give you. They're going to say that Earth receives energy from the sun. I understand. I've seen it many times. They'll say, well, see, that's how we overcome the second law. The sun is losing energy, that's true, but we are gaining some of it, so that's how we're able to work this. That's why evolution works. That is a cop-out for an answer, okay? And it's not true either. I mean, it is true the Earth receives energy from the sun, but it's not true that that's going to overcome the second law. Adding energy is destructive unless there's a very complicated mechanism to harness the energy. Question. Does gasoline have energy? Can you light it <coughs> and get some power out of it? Sure. Why don't you pour the front seat of your car full of gasoline and drop in a match? You got all that energy. Is your car going to run? No. It's true gasoline contains energy that can be, you know, but it has to have a way to harness it a very complicated way to harness it. It takes a really complicated set of machineries to harness the energy from gasoline. You have to have a carburetor or fuel injection system or something, a means of breaking the gas up into molecules or smaller and mixing it with air. You have to have a way of sucking it in. You have to have an intake stroke, you know. You have to have a way of compressing it like a piston, a way of firing it off like a spark plug, a whole system of electrical just to get the spark to fire at the right time. Then you've got to have a very complicated drivetrain to transfer this energy to the back wheels. No, it's not correct to say adding energy solves the problem. You have to have something to use the energy. The Japanese added all kinds of energy to Pearl Harbor one time. Didn't organize a thing for us. A couple years later, we returned the favor and added energy to a couple of their cities, didn't we? Didn't organize a thing. Adding energy is destructive. I don't know how the evolutionists don't get this. The sun adds energy to your house, but it's going to destroy the roof on your house. The houses are in serious disrepair, just sitting in the sun. The roof on your car will be destroyed by the sun's energy. The upholstery in your car is going to be destroyed by the sun, not built, destroyed. The paint job is going to be destroyed on your car. There's only one thing that can actually use the sun's energy, and that's chlorophyll plant cells. Each little plant cell is more complicated than a city. Evolution violates the second law of thermodynamics. Evolution theory is wrong. First and second thermodynamic, they are laws, okay, not theories. They're laws. There are no known exceptions to those. Evolution is actually not even a good theory. It's a religion. This textbook shows the kids a fossil starfish. And it says right here, plain as day, they're 3.4 billion years old, the remains of the early ancestors of modern human beings. Was your great, 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 great grandpa a starfish? Here's Discover Magazine, November 2004. Was your ancestor a sea sponge? They've got a picture with the arrow here. It shows a sea sponge. It says, this is your ancestor. Wow, who's your daddy? <laughs> SpongeBob. 
I, I have a hard time understanding who would make a cartoon so dumb. SpongeBob SquarePants. What? Huh? I don't understand why it's popular. I watched about five minutes of it one time and said, this is an insult to my intelligence. This is stupid. Well, here, this textbook author uh, said, 30 million years ago, larger primates such as monkeys and apes evolved. There's that word evolved. You've got to watch that word, okay? And whenever you see this millions of years ago, what it really means is long ago and far away means the fairy tale's coming next, okay? 30 million years ago, these critters evolved. It says they're ancestral to both humans and modern apes. Ancestors to humans? Grandpa? What big eyes you have, Grandpa. <laughs> oh, the better to see you with my boy. And here we are teaching the kids they're animals, and they, and they act like animals, and some people can't seem to figure out why. You don't need to be a genius to figure this out, folks. Barbara Reynolds in her article said, your kids go ape in school, here's why he's being taught evolution. She could figure out, if you teach a kid he's an animal, guess what he's going to act like? An animal. This textbook's used in Escambia County, Florida. This county right here, until a couple years ago, I think they got another one. It says, you are an animal and share a common heritage with earthworms. Well, then again, how do you tell right from wrong? I'm just an animal? Uh, okay. I think we have a serious problem on this planet because of what we're teaching the kids. If you go to a society where they, they're headhunters, they believe, you know, when you kill somebody in battle, cut off his head and you will get his spirit. Suppose some kid is taught from the time, he's, he can, time he can understand. Now, son, if we go to war and you kill an enemy, be sure to cut his head off and eat his brains because, you know, then you will get his spirit and you'll be twice as strong. What's that kid going to do when he goes to battle against an enemy? He's going to cut his head off and eat his brains. What you believe determines how you behave. You tell some Muslim kid, okay, kid, now listen. If you die in the cause of Islam and you can take a Christian or a Jew with you, if you die in the process of killing a Jew, you will become a martyr. And if you can tie bombs to yourself and walk into a crowded marketplace and blow up yourself and kill a bunch of people, you get to go to heaven and get 72 virgin wives all tied to the couch, hollering, oh, come over, me next, me next, okay? And they're taught this. That's what they're taught. And you get some kid whose hormones develop five years before the brain, which is what almost every case. And what's he going to do? <laughs> he turns 19 years old. He can't find a job. You know, the economy's pretty poor. Hey, I want to go to heaven, you know. And he can tie bombs around themselves and go blow themselves up in the middle of a crowded shopping market. Uh, shopping, uh, yeah, shopping mart. What you believe determines your behavior. That is true of every single religion. That's true of in, it's, in so many areas of life. You be careful what you believe. You tell the kids they're an animal, they act like animals. And that's exactly what we're seeing. You're just an animal. I have seen a tragic change in the last 40 some years since I was in school, grade school. Something's changed, folks. Big time, radical change. When I was a kid in grade school, kids got in trouble, you know, for throwing spit wads. I stood with my nose in the circle on the chalkboard several times, you know, for... Now, look at the stuff they get in trouble for, you know. Bringing guns to school, you know, killing somebody, you know, uh, drugs. Man, when I was in school, and if some girl got pregnant before she was married, it was an embarrassment, and she dropped out of school, and, you know, now it's you, they're running around the hall all the time like that. It's not a big deal. I am so convinced that this theory of evolution is not only dumb, it's dangerous, that I've dedicated my life to doing what I can to, to stop it, set the record straight. The rock music these days is awful of death and destruction and blood. Well, the Bible says, they that hate me love death. You can watch the Hollywood movies. There's always some destruction or death or blood in these movies these days. They don't build things, they tear things down. 
What is this doing psychologically to prepare people for a coming revolution of some kind? Oh, yeah, we've got to go tear this world down so we can build a new... That's what the Phoenix is all about. You know, the One World Order, New World Order plan, you know, is to tear everything down and build a new One World Order. That's Satan's plan, okay? That's not God's plan. And there's a long, interesting story about all that. Anyway, we'll talk more about that next week, about what you believe determines your behavior. Kids are taught there are no absolutes. I had a professor say that to me one time. He said, there are no absolutes. I said, are you absolutely sure? <laughs> Blew his little brain. Now, wait a minute. How can I be absolutely sure there's no absolutes? And we'll talk about absolutes in the next session. Any questions before we go? Yes, sir. What is thermodynamics? Thermo means heat, like a thermometer, thermostat, okay? Dynamic is where we get a word dynamo, which means uh, power. So thermodynamic means heat power. Whenever there's an exchange of, uh, you know, you, ch you take a piece of wood and you burn it and you produce heat out of it, it is now gone to heat, but that heat is going to dissipate throughout the universe and you're never going to be able to get it back. You won't be able to use it twice, okay? Uh, your body produces heat from the food you eat, okay? And it's gone. You've got to eat some more. And then you get the next day you've got to eat some more. It's a never-ending process. So that's basically the word thermo means heat and dynamics means power. So based on this, the laws of thermodynamics tell us that the whole universe is gradually using up all of its available energy and it's going to be lost as heat. It's, no, it's irretrievable. Outer space, deep space is like 3 degrees Kelvin, which is minus 455 Fahrenheit. I mean, cold. If all of the stars burned up all of their fuel, which they eventually will, everything will be burned up the whole universe now, instead of being minus 455, will probably be minus 454 and a half. Okay, we might be able to warm everything up a half degree by burning everything. It's called a heat death. And it's inevitable the universe will experience a heat death if it goes long enough because of the laws of thermodynamics. It's all winding down, it's all falling apart, it's losing its energy. But it's losing it to space and it's, you know, it's irretrievable. Okay? Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, would you repeat the law of conservation? Again? The, one of, I, we, we didn't really give a quote for that law, but if a spinning object explodes or breaks apart, the pieces will spin the same direction. That's one of it. Another part of the conservation laws are if you concentrate the mass toward the center, the velocity picks up. There are quite a few laws regarding spinning objects, and that's just, I don't think I ever actually gave a particular quote for that one. I'm going to phrase the law. No. Okay, other questions? Good. See you next week.